the Spring School. And I'm Vicky Dewey. I'm going to introduce the speaker for today. This is Christiana Koch from the Freie Universität Berlin. So Christiana is a professor of uh, theoretical physics at the Freie Universität, and she's an expert in quantum control, both in formal uh, aspects of quantum control, such as controllability, numerical methodologies, and optimal control theory, and also has uh, undertaken many applications to a quantum control to a wide range of physical systems, um, including, on the one hand, cold molecules, cold collisions, and chiral molecules, so definitely on the molecular side, and more recently then also on quantum information systems, including superconducting uh, qubits, quantum gates for trapped atoms and, and other systems. So today she is going to lecture for us on control of open quantum systems. Janet, it's all over to you. Okay. So maybe I should announce if about questions. If people have questions, they should please put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Uh, or I think you can also maybe raise your hand and I and there are two moderators who will be here at some point and we will be monitoring those and we'll either interrupt Christiana if this something seems very important or else uh, wait till the breaks. Okay, so thank you very much, Birgitta. Um, just a final check before I really get started. Um, is my screen visible? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so um, control of open quantum systems. You've heard already um, a little bit about open quantum systems in Daniel's lecture um, yesterday. So here, um, let's now go to the second point in this um, in this title, namely control. So what is control? And the most general answer that you can find that you can give to that uh, question is control is when you steer a dynamical system from an initial to a final state using some external knob. So let's first get a feel of that answer in terms of um, some cartoon examples. So here's one that you may um, not expect in a talk on, in a lecture on control of open quantum systems, but it's just to make the point that control um, is a very general concept and control theory is something that is used across many different uh, domains, including aerospace um, engineering. If you go um, more towards things that uh, Birgitta mentioned in her introduction, things that are close to my heart, like controlling molecules or atoms, um, then this could be um, a laser field that drives a specific transition between some initial and final molecular or atomic states. And if we think of uh, quantum information, then, um, Carrying out a gate can actually also be cast um, in that framework. Um, so here's a schematic depiction and here's an example. What does it mean for two states of an electron spin to undergo a conditional rotation gate? Okay, so the difficulty of course in theoretical physics is that once we have some intuition, we uh, need to come connect it to our mathematical tools. So let's do that. Um, and let's really be specific. What does it mean to have um, a dynamical system that we want to steer from some initial to some final state? And let's start with this example of the motion um, of spacecraft. So there, our um, dynamical system or in other words, the equations of motion are of course nothing but uh, Newton's equations. And if we reduce our spacecraft to a single uh, mass point in our typical way of trying to make things as simple as possible, then this reduces to um, m 
times the acceleration is given by the force. If we think of the laser control of atoms and molecules, um, then we are on quantum terrain. And assuming that the dynamics that we're um, executing is much faster than any dissipative time scale, we can describe it in terms of the time-dependent um, Schrödinger equation, where our Hamiltonian includes the interaction with the laser field and therefore uh, is time-dependent. And if we think in terms of uh, quantum information, we typically do have to worry about the coherence of our quantum system being open. And then the relative equation of motion is that for the density operator, and it has a coherent uh, term. Just need to make sure I get the signs right. Where the commutator with the Hamiltonian of the density operator is just the part that you would also have in the Schrödinger equation. And then you get, in addition, the uh, dissipator that acts um, as a super operator um, on our density matrix. So with this, we have covered the statement of what is the dynamical system. And then if we want to steer the motion of um, a spacecraft, we need to specify some initial state and some final state. So that's um, the next step. So let's assume what we are interested in is to land um, the spacecraft on the moon. So we have some position at initial time. And because this is a second order um, differential equation, we also need a second initial condition. So let's say the velocity um, at the initial time. And then, um, then again, if our goal is to, to land the spacecraft, we want to do this at a specific uh, position. So let's call this position um, RF for our final. And we want to do this softly. We don't want to crash the spacecraft um, onto the surface of the moon. So the velocity should be zero. Similarly, now let's go to the other two examples. So we have, um, let's say, some initial um, wave packet or some initial state. So depending on whether we look at uh, an atom or a molecule, then we have here one or more um, positions. It's not really relevant for the point of the argument that I want to make. Just need to know. this wave function. And then our target is a specific state at the final time. So at the final time uppercase T, we want this to match um, the state that describes our target um, as a function of the particle coordinate or whatever. And again, in uh, quantum information, initial state of the system would be a density operator. So let's call this rho zero. We assume that we know it. And it can also be not just a single one, but uh, more than one. But that would just be um, straightforward extension using the quantum superposition principle, never mind. And then we have either a single um, target state, or if we want to impose a gate, like um, on the sketch in the previous slide, then indeed we have here not just a single initial state, um, uh, it's a single target state, but a whole set of them. Where J runs over the elements of a suitable basis. And I'll come back to that point um, later on. Finally, 
finally, we make a statement um, in our definition that the way we can control is via external knobs. So what is the external knob when we fly a spacecraft? And again, let's assume that we can describe our spacecraft really as a point a particle. We don't care about the specific um, geometry. Um, and then what we typically do when flying a spacecraft is we burn fuel. And this burning of fuel leads to a time dependent uh, mass. And of course, also to a force which is exerted um, on the spacecraft that we have to then include in the equations of motion. For the laser control of reactions, our Hamiltonian describes the interactions with the, um, some external field. So typically it's the electric field of the laser pulse. So we have a dipole operator times the electric field. And similarly in quantum information, it's the coherent part of the evolution. So this Hamiltonian here, that depends on controls. And these controls can be an abstract set of functions. Let's call them UK to adopt the more mathematical version um, or um, it could be where, where this UK can be either electric or magnetic field. So for example, if we think of a two level system, a qubit, then we represent it in terms of the Pauli operators. And then we could have one control that couples um, longitudinally, which means via a sigma z, and the second control that couples via sigma x. And depending on what this real two level system um, is, whether it's uh, two levels in an atom, um, or whether it's um, a spin, then um, these controls U here can be either electric or magnetic field components. So the idea now of control is that because we can um, choose these functions E of T here or U1 of T, U2 of T here, we can manipulate the dynamics um, of the system. Okay, so now, as I said, this statement of what means control theory is something which is very general, but we are interested in controlling quantum systems. So the underlying dynamics is that of quantum mechanics and the essential um, statement is that we have the superposition uh, principle which encodes this fact of wave particle duality. So what does it mean um, that in our control equations, we have this wave particle duality. Well, one way to coin it was goes all the way back to Bohr in the early days um, of quantum mechanics with his famous double slit experiment. So if you have a quantum particle and you don't know um, whether the particle made its way to the detector via this one or this slit, then you'll get this interference pattern. And what in the 1920s was a Gedanken experiment. Um, nowadays is something that is happening uh, for real in the lab. So here's um, today's realization in the lab of Markus Arndt at the University of Vienna um, of this Gedanken experiment where you create a source of quantum particles. And these are actually huge molecules. You see them plotted here. You collimate them via these two gratings and send them through a slit that has this form and measure indeed um, interference patterns. And just to convince you that um, this is really very similar to what Bohr um, had thought of, here's um, from the same group an earlier um, experimental result where you see these interference fringes um, very nicely. And the difference here is a different temperature or a different coherence of those molecules. Okay, so we want to control quantum systems, which means we can make use of this superposition principle. And just to remind you, I mean, these of course are things that you have probably seen before. The important point here is that 
in quantum mechanics, the molecule interferes really with itself. And now control means we know that these ex interferences um, exist. Now let's use external fields to design them, to build them at will. Let me draw a sketch of how we envision um, this analogy with a, with a double slit experiment. So let's assume I'm starting from a coherent superposition of two states. And I can excite them to a, a joint final state. So we have here one and two, and this would be F for final. And now let's say I have um, one external field that couples me from state one to state F. And I have another external field that couples me from state two to state F. So what I'm assuming here is that this is frequency omega one, frequency omega two. And these excitation pathways are now the very abstract um, analog of the two um, ways. If you go back to this double slit, so here we have the two ways in space that the, the quantum object can take. And now we have two options in Hilbert space to go from a, a superposition state in levels one and two to a joint final state. And we will work out where the interference comes into play um, explicitly later um, in the lecture. Okay, so control means steering dynamics, quantum mechanics means we have interferences. The next question is how do we build these interferences? And the not so nice answer would be, well, you just have to be smart. But people of course have a specific rationale and this can be understood and we can work through that. So here's another um, picturization of this idea of quantum pathway interference in Hilbert space, where you do not even need a superposition state to begin with, but you have two different excitation pathways connecting the same initial and joint um, final state. And this idea for control was developed by Wuma and Shapiro um, many years ago, and we can view it as spectral interference. We have here these um, energy levels and different excitation pathways. A complementary perspective was developed at about the same time back in the 1980s um, by Tanner um, and Rice. And in their case, they built the interference in a temporal way by sending um, a first pulse and then sending a second pulse at the later time, which is either T1 or T2. And depending on the delay between the two uh, pulses, you modify the dynamics. And again, we'll work this out for a super simple example um, explicitly in the lecture. And there's a third um, idea of control that we can work out on paper, and that is so-called stimulated uh, Raman adiabatic passage, or short stirrup, which in a way is a method to choose suitable dressed states. And again, we'll get to that. Now, all these three examples, if they work very nice, but sometimes you need to make assumptions that may not be fulfilled in the specific case that you're interested in, or the system is simply too complex to, to work it out. And then you always have a favorite toy and that is optimal control theory. So here is a plan or an overview of the lecture. And I'll um, also comment on the problem set that maybe some of you have already seen um, on the notice board of the workshop. So I very briefly uh, review the prerequisites that I hope you have seen before. So frame transformations, the notion of a pi pulse in a two level system and rest states. And if you 
haven't, or maybe also if you have, um, this is covered in problems uh, one, 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 two, and one, three. So the recap section um, of those problems. And even if you are quite familiar with those prerequisites, you still may want to look at, um, at the fourth problem um, in this um, set one, which is chirping or pulses with time dependent frequency. Um, again, for two level systems, so you can uh, work out some nice dynamics there. And um, as usual, I mean, this is the way, I think by now being graduate students, you understand um, the way really to learn something is not to listen to my lecture, but um, to work yourself through um, that problem set. Then the um, first real chapter of the um, lecture and problem set number two on the, on the um, PDF is, is that exactly what I just told you on the previous slide? So these essential concepts of quantum control, of how to build interference, spectrally, um, temporally, or using the concept of adiabatic following. And where, well, the first problem set is just a generalization of these concepts from the recap session on frame transformations. Then we have spectral interference, which is um, in problem two, two, and then we have time the time dependent perspective, which is down here, and we also have this counter diabetic driving as a specific way to um, endorse adiabatic following in problem uh, two point four, and I'll comment more on those um, tasks during the lecture. Okay, so this is what we'll cover um, next, and um, then I think we deserve at least after covering this, we really deserve a break. Um, but before then moving on to optimal control theory, where I'll be more brief than in this um, part and introduce the notion of a target functional and how we can use variational calculus to calculate external control fields. And then there'll be some hands-on exercises that um, you can uh, do numerically. So, you will find the link here on um, the problem set, but let me also just show you, if you click on this link, um, it'll take you to this um, website. So it'll take you here and you have to scroll down um, and you find these binder uh, notebooks. And if you click on them, it may sometimes take quite a bit of time to open, but let's say the one for optimal control will be um, the third one and it takes you to a, ah, Dismiss. Okay. Um, never mind. It will take you to this uh, Python notebook, which you can work through in order to see how to set up an optimal control calculation. And then once you've got this uh, running, you'll find specific questions um, on the um, exercises that you can answer with the help of those um, of those notebooks. And finally, that's our target. The title of the lecture, Controlling Open Quantum Systems. I'll comment on what are the specific challenges, but also the opportunities when you have an open quantum system. I'll go briefly over some examples. And then there are also exercises which are slightly less hands-on because if you really want to go into depth, um, then um, you'll have to compile the Python script by yourself. But again, the um, hints how to do this are provided. Okay, I think this is a good point to uh, briefly stop and see if there is any urgent question. I think you're good. I don't I'm see good. any questions. I don't see any questions in Q&A or chat. No raised hands. Yeah. Okay. I think at this point, that's not so bad. If there are no questions later on, I should start to be worried. So let's start um, with reviewing what I would call the prerequisites. So something that um, I think all of you have seen in some form or the other, our friend, the two-level system. So we have 
a level that we call G for ground or zero uh, in the qubit language and E for excited or one in the qubit language. The two have a splitting between them, which we call omega zero. And then if we drive transitions, we can do this exactly on resonance. So let's call the field L for laser, of course, can be any drive. Um, if it's equal, then we are on resonance. If not, we have a small detuning. Now our Hamiltonian, I'll write it once more. So we have the splitting with sigma z and then the interaction or the control with the external field. So in case of an atom, that would be the dipole moment and the electric field um, of the laser. And let's make this not an operator, but let's write it directly in terms of sigma x. And what we have to look at is the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Where H is obtained by adding um, H0 and H control. And the electric field, let's assume it's given by some amplitude, E0, some envelope function that I call S of T, and then the carrier um, frequency, so cosine omega LT. Um, and that gives us a real function, which is what we ex would expect for an electric field. And now we can introduce an abbreviation and write this as omega naught, which we define in terms of this scalar product of um, D and E0. Now, one reason why um, the two-level system is our friend is because we can solve many things um, analytically. But what I think is even more important is that we can visualize it very nicely. So I hope that Daniel got around to introducing the Bloch Google. He wanted to do that, or if not, that you have seen that before. So we have this equivalence between the two complex coefficients that characterize our qubit for states G and E. Um, and we can map this onto three real numbers um, because of the normalization of the qubit and visualize this in terms of a single vector psi here um, in this Bloch sphere. Okay, so. And we can visualize both uh, frame transformations um, and um, oh, this is not what I want. Never mind. Um, we can visualize both frame transformations, but also the dynamics of the state um, on this uh, block sphere. And that is really super useful for building intuition. So what do we mean by frame transformations? Well, one of them um, is if you go in the interaction picture. Um, so we can define a unitary transformation that is given by the exponent of the um, Hamiltonian H0, the one that does not interact with the field. So the control is what gives us the interaction. And then we have to, um, transform the Schrödinger equation. So if our state vector is given by applying the unitary transformation, so say tilde is a transformed one, um, see the original one, and then we um, use this psi here, then we get by inserting psi um, into the Schrodinger equation, we get this expression and then we can multiply with identity, making use of the fact that a unitary transformation times its um,
sometimes is to, um, the, the, the Hermitian conjugate is um, identity, and then we obtain the transformed um, Schrödinger equation where we can um, <clears throat> calculate here the derivative with the product rule and take the derivative of u to the right-hand side of the equation, then we end up with um, the time derivative of the transformed um, state vector. Here we get um, u dagger h of u minus i h bar, the term with this derivative um, u dagger du dt, and all of this applied to the state vector. And then we know that what we have here in the parenthesis is the transformed um, Hamiltonian in the um, new frame. And because what we have used here is of course the du um, dt, it's given to us in terms of this exponent. So it gives us um, by taking the derivative of the exponent i over h bar minus h zero times the exponent, so times u um, itself. And that leads to um, a quite simple Hamiltonian in the rotating frame. So because we have here um, this h zero, then correspondingly the term h zero from that cancels or you can also just multiply out, of course, for a two-level system, all these matrix multiplications is a bit tedious, but no real difficulty. And we'll end up um, with the following expression where we do one more step. We write this cosine as um, a sum of um, two exponents. And then we get here, once the exponent of the um, drive frequency minus the omega um, zero, and then so once the difference of the frequencies and once the sum of the two frequencies. And similarly, um, the complex conjugate of that expression here and zero on the diagonal. And now we can. Um, take the so-called rotating wave approximation because we assume that um, delta L, which is nothing but the difference between omega zero and omega L is much smaller than the drive um, frequency. So that's a slow time scale, whereas the sum of the two is approximately twice uh, the drive frequency. So that is um, fast. And now when we integrate um, our equation of motion, these fast oscillatory terms, they average to zero. So we neglect them and that is the rotating wave approximation. And now what I'm asking you to do um, in this um, first problem on um, problem one one, is to do this uh, frame transformation, not necessarily with H0, but uh, with sigma Z or with an Hermitian operator. And you have different uh, choices um, of the parameter that appears in the, in the unitary transformation that gives you slightly different rotating frames. And it would be good if you visualize um, exactly how the um, reference frame is rotating when, when you do this transformation. Okay, in any case, once we've done the rotating uh, wave approximation and we've neglected these fast um, oscillating terms, then we end up with um, an equation of motion for our two level system that we can also write out component wise and um, solve analytically in complete form. I'm not going uh, to do that. You find it um, in textbooks, but the um, solution then is the so-called um, Rabi oscillations, where 
if we start with, let's say, the two level system in the ground state and then look at the um, population in the excited state as a function of time, we find these oscillations where the population is completely in the excited state if um, omega times the time equals um, pi. And hence, if we have a field which is on for exactly that time as a square pulse, then that would be a so-called pi pulse. And if we continue the, to keep the field on, then we return to the ground state that would be at two pi and so on. And you see the solid line here is what happens if you're exactly on resonance so drive and omega zero are identical. And if you're a bit detuned, um, then these oscillations get faster and we do not get complete population inversion. So what we see um, in this figure is that populations oscillate with frequency omega prime which is the so-called generalized uh, Rabi frequency and is given by the square root um, of the omega zero plus the detuning squared. Whereas the amplitudes um, oscillate with half of that um, frequency. And now that is just something that you'll get if you solve the equations of motion, um, very straightforward. Something that many people are not aware is with which frequency does the dipole oscillate? Or in other words, the expectation value of sigma z. And let's really write what I mean. So if we have our state vector, And let's see what happens here. So we have our um, two level system. With energy splitting um, omega zero. And now let's assume that we're a bit um, detuned. So we have an excitation, let's call it like this. Um, so this is our ground state, this is our excited state. And this is omega. L. Now, if the, um, these frequencies omega zero and hence um, omega prime are quite large, what happens is that these levels actually split And now I'm cheating a little bit in my sketch because of course this distance is much, much larger um, than those because in the rotating wave approximation, that's what we've um, assumed, but bear with me. And so while this splitting was omega zero, now this splitting here is omega prime. And the small one, here is um, omega L minus omega prime. So in this so-called dressed state picture, what we see are three um, distinct frequencies with which um, simulated emission and absorption can happen. And that is we have um, this omega L minus um, omega prime, we have um, omega L here, which is um, here, this distance and that distance. And then we can also have 
um, emission from, let's say, that level all the way to the lowest one or absorption from the lowest level all the way to the um, uppermost one. And that would be omega L plus um, omega prime. So the dipole oscillates with um, three different frequencies, namely the original drive frequency, omega L, but also with omega L plus or minus um, omega prime, the generalized Rabi frequency. Okay, so so much for our, our short recap and maybe just to put the uh, exercise number 1.4 into a bit more perspective. So here, if you um, look at these oscillations, you may think that actually you need to get the timing of the pulses super precisely in order to make sure that you get population inversion and not end up, let's say here. Um, and one way to circumvent this necessity to have the timing, the durations of your pulse um, selected very precisely, you can use um, time dependent frequencies or chirps. And um, the point of this exercise is for you to, to see what is the effect of the chirp um, on that, on these population oscillations. Okay, so so much for um, for the recap. Now let's um, come to the chapter one of the lecture, the essential concepts on quantum control and how to build interferences either spectrally or temporarily or choosing suitable dress states. And let's look at spectral interference uh, first and let's use the simple example I gave um, at the beginning um, of the lecture. So assume we start from a superposition. So we have here levels um, one and two and some final state F. And you're assuming this is an assumption that we can um, potentially argue about, but let's allow me to make it for the moment that initially we are in a coherent superposition between levels one and two. So C1, zero, C2, zero are some um, complex numbers that specify my initial state. And so the total electric field now is given by the superposition of um, the one with omega one and the one with omega two. And for simplicity, let's assume that we just have the carrier frequency and no further time dependence because we don't need it to make the point that I want you to see. Again, our Hamiltonian is H0, which just contains the energy um, levels and the interaction with the laser field, this superposition of the two fields, so H0 is simply the diagonal matrix with the two eigenvalues and the interaction is such that we go from level one to level F or from level two to level F. Um, And what I've used here is these um, uppercase omegas with indices i and j. And now 
pay attention that um, I tells me um, from which state I'm going uh, to the, okay, and I made already a mistake myself. Let me correct that. Um, so this is really one, um, three, Let me write what I wanted to say. So we have here the matrix element that connects the state um, I to the final state. And then we have the field component um, J, where J is equal to one or two for the two components um, in my um, field. And in, um, the rotating wave approximation, then this will be um, one, one, and this will be um, two, two. And complex conflict. Okay, now what we want to um, see is how the population in this final state. Um, looks like if I solve the time dependent um, Schrodinger equation, and I'll do this only in uh, first order perturbation theory because this is sufficient um, to see the effect. So, in first order perturbation theory, the correction to first order is given by the formal solution of one over i h bar, and then I integrate from the initial time to the present time over dt prime. And I have to read it from right to left, but allow me to write it from um, left to right. So we're starting from the initial state at time t equals to zero. And then we propagate it under the uh, free Hamiltonian from time t zero to time t prime. At time t prime, the interaction happens instantaneously. And then we continue to propagate with the field free Hamiltonian from time t prime to the final time t of our integral. And now, if you look at our assumption um, on the initial state of being in a superposition of levels one and two, and we look at the structure of our interaction um, Hamiltonian, then we see that the first order correction, if we write it um, in the basis of the levels one, two, and F, can only have a contribution um, in the state F. So instead of writing this abstract um, state vector, I can just write this amplitude to first order and perturbation theory. And if I multiply out um, the matrix of the interaction um, Hamiltonian with my initial superposition state, then I get two contributions. So I have the integral over T prime, where after the interaction, I am in state F. So when I apply the um, H zero, I just get the energy EF. I have from the interaction Hamiltonian here, um, the first contribution of the field with this omega one one. And before the interaction at time t prime, I propagate 
the C1 part of my superposition state. I get the similar integral with the um, C1, uh, with the uh, first part of the field acting on um, the first part of the state superposition. Then I get the second part of the field acting on the first part of the superposition. And finally, the um, second part of the field acting on the second part of the superposition. So really just inserting uh, my Hamiltonian and my initial state superposition into this formal um, solution. And now what I can do is again write this um, cosine as the sum of um, omega one i i omega one t prime and minus i omega one t prime. So that gives me this prefactor of two that I can take out of the integral. This is just a complex number which I can also take out of the um, integral. Then um, I'm integrating over t prime, so e to the minus i over h bar e f t doesn't depend on t prime. It's just a phase factor that I take out of the integral. Same here for the term with t zero. And e one. And then I'm left inside the integral with um, that part from this exponent that contains t prime, that part from that exponent that contains t prime, I can of course uh, combine those to give me exponent of i over h bar ef um, minus e1 t prime. And then I have the two exponents from this cosine, so e omega one t plus e minus omega one t. Um, and similarly for the remaining um, three integrals. Now, this prefactor here in front of the integral, that's just some uh, complex um, coefficient that I can call c one zero tilde. So I absorb these two exponents into my initial um, into my initial um, amplitude. And then when I take the rotating wave approximation, I'm again, this is the um, energy difference uh, between the two levels. So I only keep here the minus one that gives me the detuning of omega one from the resonance. And I neglect the term that oscillates with essentially twice that um, frequency. So my final state amplitude um, after invoking the rotating wave approximation is then given by um, the Ravi frequency of that um, part of the field, this modified initial state amplitude and then the integral from T zero to T um, over the exponent of the transition frequency between one and F and our drive frequency. And the remaining three integrals that I get from the other terms of multiplying out my initial superposition and the field. Now, what I'm really interested in is the final um, population in this level F so I can let T go um, to infinity and similarly t0 to minus infinity, and then exploit the fact that in this case, the integral over um, the exponent is simply given by two pi delta of um, omega. And with this, I end up for my final state superposition now at um, 
when everything is over, infinite time limit, I only am left with two contributions. Two of the integrals go away because of the, um, I'm not on resonance. So only omega one, one and two, two um, contribute. And then here I get a pi. And now I made an important omission in the very beginning. Let me go back here. I should not have assumed um, that these fields necessarily have the same frequency, uh, the same uh, phase. There may be a phase difference uh, between them. So of course I could write here plus phi one and here plus phi two, but really what matters is just the relative phase. So let me call this relative phase phi. And if I do this, and if I um, account for this when um, inserting the um, electric field in these integrals, then I get a second term. where this phase shows up as e to the i phi. Okay, and now what is the population? In this um, final state at time infinity, so population means we have to square the amplitude and then we get p squared that we can take out when multiplying out the square and then we get square of this first Rabi frequency with the first component of the field. The um, exponents in this phase, the phase factor in this complex amplitude C1 tilde zero and C2 tilde zero don't matter. So I can just take the square of my initial amplitudes here. And then I get the cross term uh, that I can combine and that gives me twice the real part of these field amplitudes, omega one, one, omega two, two, my initial state amplitudes. And one of them is complex conjugate and this phase factor. And it's, so this term, these squares they depend on the um, initial superposition set and on the intensity of each of the fields, okay? But the interesting term is this one. So that's what gives rise to interference. And the interference term depends on the intensity um, of the field, but more importantly, on the relative phase between the two uh, lasers, the two excitation pathways and the initial superposition. So let's first write this and then go back and um, look at what this means in more pictorial terms. Okay, so we have here these two excitation pathways and we allowed for a relative phase between them. So by tuning this phase, we can make this interference in the final state um, constructive or destructive. And destructive really to the extent of having no population um, in the state despite having um, excitation. Okay, so first point, done. Shall I go to the complementary perspective or are there questions? There have been there a few been questions. questions. Okay, but my question of course is, are there questions that I should answer now or um, have the questions been taken care of in the chat or? So they can mostly be taken care of in the chat. There was someone who raised a hand, but I don't see it anymore. Uh, is there any question, someone who raised a hand from the main audience? No. Well, if not, then I think Philippe's just answering the final question in the Q&A and there aren't any 
unanswered questions in the chat either. So go ahead. Okay, so then I suggest I will quickly go over the um, complementary perspective and then maybe we are ready to take um, a short break before continuing um, with the further material. Sounds good. Okay, so let's have a look at these Rabi oscillations and again our uh, two level system picture. So if you work out all the math that I skipped over now for the driven uh, two level system, then we know that the general solution of our state vector is a time dependent population, the natural evolution with a given um, energy for the ground state. And then of course the same for the excited state. And we may now wonder, so we've seen the relative phase between the two excitation pathways was what um, gave rise to the interference term um, in the previous slide. Now here we also have uh, phases, these uh, dynamical phases because of the um, different energies of our two level system. And of course, for the um, populations, this natural time evolution that is um, given by these phases is irrelevant. So by this, I mean these phase factors And what we, if we want to see interference, then we have to somehow be able to probe relative phases between the two states. Okay, so we should think of how we can turn this into um, a relative phase. And this phenomenon has in the past been called the quantum uh, beats. And what it suggests is that we need two steps. So first we have to um, prepare a superposition state because if we have a superposition state, then um, the phase between the two states is a relative phase. And then second, we have to probe the superposition. So these, this type of control is also called pump probe because the preparation of the superposition state in the original um, variance has been thought of in this way that you start from some initial state, and then you have two states into which you excite, and that prepares your um, superposition state. So let's assume we have a field with frequency, which is broadband. So the bandwidth of this field is so large that both um, levels are still within the bandwidth of the pulse, and then we can excite a coherent superposition of these two levels. We can think of other preparation methods as well. So you could think in a two level system of so-called Hadamard gate that prepares out of the ground state a superposition. And then we can in a second step probe our um, coherent superposition, for example, in the setting in a similar way where we go to some final state. And then the population in um, 
the state f into which we probe depends um, on, on the time. So again, we can treat this with the arguments of perturbation theory. So let's assume that we have um, prepared our superposition state psi of t. <clears throat> and then instantaneously we probe that state and to first order perturbation theory, this projects the superposition onto the state f. And now since we have started, let's say, with an equal superposition of um, these two states. So then we have this prefactor one over um, square root of two. And again, we can here now multiply out the square. So we get um, two constant terms that only depend on the matrix elements connecting state A to F and B to F. But then we also have the cross term, which depends on the magnitude of the matrix elements and the cosine of one over H bar and the energy difference between um, a and B or the difference, the phase that evolves uh, in our superposition state. Okay, so this modulation is then something that we can measure. So let's assume can we probe instantaneously at time t and t and we can change this t with respect to the preparation step. So then we will see this modulation uh, with the cosine um, in our final state population. Okay, and at this point, I wanted again to refer to, um, to the problem sets. So for the um, spectral interference, that would be covered in problem um, two, two, where uh, we're looking at a two-level system that is excited uh, by a broadband pulse and again use perturbation theory to um, show how um, the choice of the, the pulse um, modifies the population of the um, upper state. And problem two, three is one that takes a temporal um, perspective. And there uh, we make use of the fact just for um, a two-level system that um, by adjusting the field of the, the phase of the external field, which here we have ignored. So here we just used the delay between uh, these two steps, but of course we can also introduce um, a phase of the external field and we can use this phase to compensate some of the intrinsic um, evolution. And that's um, what is done, what should be done um, in problem 2.3. So Christiana, there's a question. Mm -hmm. um, someone has a raised hand. Could you, can the person speak up please? Richard. I'm not sure they're actually allowed to speak up. That's the. So if you have a question, could you put it in the Q and A or in the chat and that way we'll see it and we will pass it on to Christiana. Okay, and I think, so here we have now a check mark for this and for that. And the dress state is a slightly more extended calculation. So on my watch, it's um, 41 minutes past five. So I suggest that we maybe take a break of what? Four minutes or nine minutes? What do you think? Um. We're going to have two breaks, right? Yeah. Well, it's up to you. It's really you're the one doing the work. <laughs> uh, let's yeah, let's say. Nice, Christian. Richard. 
What do you suggest? <laughs> us. us. Okay, let's let's say uh, we reconvene uh, ten minutes to whatever the full hour is on your time zone. That will be a, ten minutes to ten. Yeah. Ten minutes that's to nine 10? minutes. Yeah, that's, that's nine like, minutes then, right? Not, it's okay. nine minutes or eight minutes. Uh, so the, and right. um, and I'll take the question that um, maybe the raised hand person is typing now in the Q and A before we yeah. continue. Yeah. Yeah. Good idea. Oh, it's Matthew Bogoswavsky. Yeah, so Matthew, please type your question in the Q&A and Christian answer, will answer it then when, when, when we come back. Okay, see you soon then.
Okay, so um, before we continue, let me just answer. I think there are um, two, three more questions in, in the um, Q&A that, that are quite interesting and worth um, discussing in, in public. So, um, and let me maybe share the screen again. Um, so the first question is, what is the meaning of this uh, red curve? So, and the, the person who asked the question already figured out the answer uh, themselves. It's the bandwidth um, of the laser, so we, or, or the electric field can be whatever. Um, so we assume that this um, the bandwidth of the field is such that it addresses both um, levels simultaneously, um, which is whenever you have a, a, a pulse which is short, doesn't have to be Gaussian as I alluded to here, but just if you have a finite uh, pulse duration, you have a broad spectral distribution. And the follow-up question then was, doesn't this introduce noise in the system? And the answer is no, that's exactly, it's a very good question, but that's exactly the point. Um, it's still a fully coherent picture and a fully coherent interaction. So it may introduce transitions to levels that you don't want if you have a multi-level um, system, but everything is still, is still coherent. So no, no noise. Um, noise would mean that you have a jitter in the amplitude or something like this. We would need quite a different framework of, of uh, describing that. Everything I've talked so far about is, uh, is fully coherent. Okay, so I would say this addresses the uh, questions by Akash. Then Stanislav. Um, If the levels one and two have the same frequencies and their transition to F depends only on photon polarization, the Hamiltonian differs much. Um, well, if you if the transition depends on the polarization, um, then you might not be able to drive both transitions at the same time. So I think that's something that would not be captured um, by the by the simple model that I have used. Um, for, um, for these examples. And then the question by Jalil, um, the target state um, was in, in both cases, the population um, of the level F. So let's go back um, here. So, in the first problem on the spectral interference, we wanted to check if we can um, control how much population ends up in F. And it's not surprising that the population that ends up in F depends on these uh, frequencies. So then it's best if they, these are on resonance. And it's also not surprising that it depends on the intensity of the pulse. It is surprising that it also depends on the relative frequency between the two excitation pathways. So that is what I call the spectral interference. Okay, and um, then in the second uh, problem, again, the uh, measure where we checked for the interference was the population of this final state that we had used to probe um, the superposition between A and B2. And it's this population that we've we've checked. And then there was the question that I think was also answered by, by one of the tutors. So thanks very much uh, for that. But I would like to come back to that because I think that's really um, an important question and one that has actually kept the control community um, busy for quite some time. Namely, is this type of interference um, a requirement for control? It's not, but I would say, the, it's the essence of quantum mechanics that we can use these interferences. So we can also use more classical concepts of control where we say, let's say in case of this uh, pathway interference, right? We have two frequencies, omega one and omega two. And if it simply say, okay, we, we cancel the, these amplitude um, of the second field and then we have just one, one pathway, um, then we will not excite from, from level two. 
if that's if you want to keep level uh, population in level two there. That would be, of course, a completely valid um, strategy. Um, but that you could also do um, in, in a classical picture. So the, what, what we have on top, because we have the laws of quantum mechanics governing our equations of motion is spectral interference or is interference, sorry, is the superposition principle. So interference, and if you look at uh, multipartite quantum systems and also non-classical correlations. And these examples simply serve the purpose of, of highlighting um, the control schemes that you can uh, build by hand if you want to exploit these specific quantum features. Okay, so um, this is where we were. Let me check if there's something else before I should go on. I think not. I think then, good. Yeah. You're good. Okay. Yeah. So then let's go to um, the dressed states and the idea of adiabatic um, following. So let's consider a Hamiltonian. It's very similar to what we've discussed before. We have um, a drive and uh, sorry, we have a drift. So the field free term H zero and then an interaction. And now let me write this to be really um, general as W. And let's not restrict ourselves to, um, to two level system. It could be um, N level, whatever you choose. And then we have possibly a transition between uh, one and two, um, one and three, and so on. Okay, now the idea is that we can diagonalize um, for each instant, an instant of time, so for each T, we can diagonalize this Hamiltonian. So there exists um, a unitary transformation that diagonalizes this H of T. So we can write that the Hamiltonian um, after this transformation then is um, diagonal, diagonal matrix with the time dependent eigenvalues um, on the diagonal. So it, this may be a bit of an unusual perspective because we have a time dependent problem, but of course, if we fix T, then we are back to standard uh, quantum mechanics and we can find the eigenvalues um, of the Hamiltonian. And now we can write um, the, the transformed state again so before I use tilde, let's use this again um, by applying this unitary transformation to our original state. And now here comes the idea of what is called adiabatic following. And this goes as follows, let's assume that at our initial time, all these um, controls, all these Ws are switched off. And let's assume we prepare um, our system in one eigenstate, whatever one you want of H0. And now we want to choose the time dependence um, of these uh, Ws such that we stay in the eigenstate. So the eigenstate itself will change because my Hamiltonian changes with time. But I can still number the eigenstates and I want to stay in the same, uh, in the eigenstate with the same number. This time dependent eigenstate in turn is a superposition of the field free states of the eigenstates of H0. But um, if I can connect smoothly each of the eigenvalues for each, um, time and stay in the in the eigenstate corresponding to the eigenvalue that I that I've chosen um, that is called adiabatic following 
And the point is that one can check the conditions when this will actually happen um, again, at least for two-level system or for simple problems analytically. So let's look at the transformed Schrodinger equation to see when do we have the chance to stay in the time-dependent eigenstate with time-dependent eigenvalue. So our transformed Schrodinger equation is given by the diagonal part, so this um, D. And then we have an addition. Remember, we just did this frame uh, transformation. So we get a term where the derivative of this unitary transformation shows up. And now I exchanged the order of u and u dagger. I'm sorry for that, but it just means we are rotating either in this direction or in that direction. Okay, so this is our um, our transformed Schrödinger equation after um, taking the unitary transformation that diagonalizes H. Now, if it was not for this second term, okay, if I could cross this out, at least forget about it for a moment, then I have here a diagonal operator that acts on my state. So if my, if I expand my state vector in the eigenbasis of H0, um, and I evolve the, the state and this D with time according to this prescription, then I will always stay in that eigenstate. However, I do have here this additional term in my Schrodinger equation. So that corresponds, or that potentially can have off-diagonal matrix elements. And then these off-diagonal matrix elements would introduce transitions between different eigenstates. So it's the second term here that describes non-adiabatic transitions. In other words, if this term, or at least the off-diagonal matrix elements of the second term here are very, very small, then indeed I obey adiabatic following. I stay in the um, chosen eigen um, state belonging to the chosen eigenvalue. So let's um, look at this in a bit uh, more detail and let's look what this condition of having here negligible off-diagonal elements really means for the specific case of a two-level system. Okay, so here's again our um, transformed Schrödinger equation. I just forgot the tildes. Um, so, so for a two-level system or qubit, um, we know what is the transformation that diagonalizes a two-level system. We can write it as cosine of theta squared e to the i over two phi. So we have two angles. And I'm going over this fast again because I think you may have seen this one way um, or another. If not, it's a nice exercise um, to do in order to convince yourself that you um, understand things, where these angles are given by, so theta is given in terms of the ratio of the coupling between the two levels and their energy um, difference. Okay, so I called here the levels A and B and their coupling is WAB. And I write WAB, which can be complex in general to account for a magnitude and phase. And it's exactly that phase that appears here. <clears throat> so this is the most general uh, form that can happen. And this is the, the transformation, the unitary that diagonalizes 
um, the two-level system Hamiltonian with coupling WAB. Now I can calculate the second term. Okay, and I'm just, I won't go of course here through all the algebra um, that it takes to do this um, matrix multiplication after taking the derivative. It's surprisingly um, simple because it's um, the derivative of T which is on the diagonal and it's the derivative of theta, which is on the off diagonal. Okay, so, um, and again, you're invited to, to check the algebra and, and redo um, this calculation. But now we, we know what is this potential bad guy. And it's these two, um, matrix elements, okay, which would be responsible for non-adiabatic transitions. So let's check when, when is this small and small in physics typically means we have to compare it against um, something. And the point is that a transition here will only happen um, if we are resonant. So this derivative of theta um, with respect to time has to be much smaller than the um, difference between the dressed eigen energies. So E plus minus of T are the time dependent um, eigenvalues of my two level system. And those, I mean, I quickly rewrite it, but those you all have seen probably more than once. And we can um, write them as specifically if you assume, let's say already, if you're um, doing this in the rotating frame, let's say our Hamiltonian would be, um, detuning with sigma z and uh, Hobby frequency with sigma x, then this e plus minus is simply plus minus h bar over two um, omega of t, where omega of t is given by the square root of omega zero of t plus the detuning um, squared plus detuning squared, um, which can also depend on time. Okay, so now we can um, insert here this dependence on the Rabi frequency and detuning in this um, condition for adiabaticity. And we can also calculate um, theta and the, or in the derivative of theta because theta is given by this coupling matrix element. So with a notation down here in the qubit language, this would be um, omega zero. And the um, gap between the two energy eigen energies um, is given in terms of omega zero and um, delta. So so these enter here and then we can uh, just do some algebraic manipulations with a tangent and find that the derivative of theta is equal to um, the tuning times the derivative of omega zero minus omega zero d times the derivative of the detuning over omega um, squared. So 
here I'm going very fast now, but again, it's just algebra. So we've what I've used here is um, this relation, this definition of um, theta with this um, not notation, and then calculating the derivative and using um, identities for the trigonometric uh, functions to arrive um, at this form. And now we can insert here for um, the derivative of theta and we obtain that one half the magnitude of derivative of omega zero times detuning minus omega zero times derivative of detuning. This should be much smaller than omega zero squared plus delta L squared um, three third square root. So now we can um, translate this into real physics. Because what means that the um, derivative of omega zero should be small? Well, this is small if the pulse changes very slowly. In other words, if the pulse is very smooth, then um, smooth and long is this first, um, is this meaning of the, the right-hand side. So this becomes really small for pulses, which have a very smooth envelope and or correspondingly are very long. Um, and the second um, part of this inequality means I need to have large Rabi frequencies, omega zero, so strong fields, or large detuning also. So here now I have a recipe how to choose the parameters for my external um, fields in order to make sure that I stay in the time dependent eigenvalue. And we can um, fulfill this condition in various ways. So let me give you two examples. Let's assume that the detuning is constant. So then, if we go back, um, this means that our um, energies stay constant. So we can draw the eigen energies as a function of time and the populations um, as a function of time. So my field three energies are EA and EB. And now my time dependent eigenvalue is given here by the square root. So if delta is constant, then it just is given by um, the time dependence of the Rabi frequency. And now let's assume again, we smoothly switch our pulse on and off, and then this splits the levels and as the pulse goes to zero, so do the eigen energies come back to the original um, value. So this looks something like, like this where this shape is just determined by how I choose my pulse. So this would be E minus and this would be E plus. And all of this is shown as a function of time. And similarly, if I plot the populations, so Let's assume I start with one of the levels are populated, then the population is depleted a bit, but then it returns to that state. And for the other level, we just have the opposite. Oh, my drawing skills, oh, like this. 
Okay, and the another possibility. So here, in both cases, we assume adiabatic following, but the result with respect to the um, eigenstates of H0 of the field free states will be quite different. So here, let's assume that we make this detuning um, time dependent. And that is the famous linear chirp that was already mentioned on the um, exercises also. And what happens then if we plot the energy and the populations um, in this case? So we can assume that we take the detuning with respect to one of the states. So let's say we keep one up constant and then the other one, um, ah, this was not smart. Let's say, looks like this. So our um, eigenvalues um, we've taken a frame here where we put this onto the diagonal of the Hamiltonian. So one of the eigenvalues has this linear um, dependence and now the um, dress the, the eigenstates of the time dependent problem and we include the coupling between the two levels looks like this. And again, of, you can of course do this much nicer if you do calculate this analytically and then maybe use some plotting routine, but here's my sketch. So this would be now E plus and this would be E minus. So you see if you start out um, originally in EA, this is the state that you want to uh, follow adiabatically. And following adiabatically means you stay in the um, dressed eigenvalue E minus all the time. So you follow this red curve, but at final time, you're in a field free state, which is not the original one, not EA, but it's EB. And vice versa, if you start in EB, then you'll end up in e EA. So here you have um, population transfer. We can also check this by looking at the populations themselves. So what happens here is that if we start, let's say in EA, then we completely deplete EA and similarly for EB. So we have population transfer, and that is a type of population transfer, again, compared to uh, pi pulses, which is very popular because it's robust. Okay, adiabatic following is something that people tend to like a lot because of its robustness. Okay, so, um, so far so good, but still, I mean, we've identified here these conditions for adiabaticity, okay? And it may happen that with the uh, fields that you have at your hand or that your experimental colleague has at hand, you can simply not fulfill this condition. Then what? Well, then you can use a technique which is called counter-diabatic driving and for the experts, it's related to so-called shortcuts to um, adiabaticity. And the idea of counter-adiabatic driving is very simple. So if we go back to the general um, framework, okay, so we had here this term that gave us trouble. And the idea of counter-adiabatic driving is, well, let's add an additional term to the Hamiltonian. So let's assume we can choose a second interaction term with an external field that we call CD for counter-diabatic. 
And then let's choose this term such that we make this bad guy here go away. Okay, and I think once this idea is stated, it's so clear what has to be done that I want you to work out exactly the condition, um, how this has to be chosen. So all that you have to do is add here this control Hamiltonian that you do not yet know, but you can formally write it. Do the um, frame transformation for the modified Hamiltonian and then choose the freedom um, in the choice of this counterdiabatic term to make this go to zero. And that gives you an equation with which you can determine the counterdiabatic uh, drive. And that's um, the problem um, 2.4. Okay. Okay, maybe just to, to um, for those who, who wonder why um, Stirup, so here Stirup is an extension of what I've just discussed, and we'll go get back to it a little bit later. So you don't have two levels, you have three levels, and you go have only coupling between one and two and two and three, but not directly between one and three, and you want to go from one to three, and um, Stirup is short for stimulated Raman adiabatic passage. So the first part of this name is irrelevant to you. It's just because these two fields are called Raman transition um, and similar because you're driving it. Okay, an adiabatic passage, now you know what it is. It means we want to find uh, pulses that drive us adiabatically from one to three. So the same philosophy as in our two-level case, but now with this additional intermediate state. So Christiana, there's a question before you go on mm -hmm. about the term on slide 10. There's a question whether there are terms missing for the transformed Schroeder equation on slide 10. 10, here. Yeah, yeah. What should be missing? I don't think. So this is the transformed Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. right? This is this term. And this is the term that we get from taking the derivative of yeah. that part. So I think that should be OK. OK. So and I, I can ask a very quick additional question. Maybe you can comment a little bit more on the robustness the reasons for the, you say the population transfers were robust. That's really only the case if the energy levels are well separated, right? Um, yes, exactly. And that's, um, it's also contained. So I think what we really should highlight here um, is this condition. Right. So you do have here the gap between the dressed levels. So the two eigenvalues of my two level system and the, the distance between those. And so this is the transition matrix element in the um, transformed basis. And this is the uh, gap in the transformed basis. Okay, so, so if this condition is fulfilled, then you you do not have to worry about anything else. Is that what your question was, or am I missing something? And I understand it. Oh, so I just wanted you to comment for everybody, mm -hmm. sort of the origin of the robustness here. Yeah, so that's good. Yeah, so the origin of the robustness is really in this idea of um, of doing an, an the adiabatic theorem, which I haven't even mentioned, um, that if you are able to, to do the changes to your Hamiltonian slowly enough, then you're guaranteed to stay in a time dependent um, specific eigenvalue and specific eigenstate. Okay, not, 
not that that's also not very intuitive, of course. Um, right. Okay, so let me do my check marks. We've done this up, this and this and this. Okay, so here we go. Um, I already alluded to the problems that come with this um, part one, and we're now ready to go to optimal control theory, unless there's another um, urgent question. No open questions right now. Okay. Here we go, chapter um, two optimal control theory, which is another um, way to determine the fields that build the interferences that we want. And the idea is really to exploit variational calculus. Or in other words, we have to think, what is it really that we want? And we define this in terms of a real valued functional. For example, we want an initial state after we've time evolved it under an external control um, epsilon to perfectly match the target state. So this, this is the time evolved state. And if this um, scalar product with a target state is close to one, then um, except for a phase, global phase, the final state matches our target state. And now, of course, you could, could say, well, that, that's just a formal definition that we can do, but why does it help us? It helps us because we can treat this as a functional, as a function that itself depends on a function. And that function that our goal depends on is the external field, which is yet unknown. And then we can um, ask for an extremum of that functional and that asking the condition of an extremum will give us a prescription that allows us to calculate the external field. And that's the essence of optimal control theory. Well, before we do that, what we usually um, should do is include additional constraints. Um, for example, to keep the amplitude of our external controls finite um, or to include other constraints um, that may be relevant for a given um, experiment. Okay, and then we optimize this functional J or the total J that we get by adding what we want and those additional uh, constraints. And the condition for having an extremum are um, those two here. So these are the extremum conditions. Because our functional depends on the external field, it also depends on the state that is evolving. So that's why I have to, if I want this to be extremal, it has both um, the variations, both with respect to the um, control and with respect to the states have to be um, zero. Okay, and um, of course, what we also include in, in this prescription is that we um, at least formally know the time evolution, we can calculate the time evolution. Um, which is generated by this Hamiltonian. So that's one way um, of, of doing the optimization and that is called gradient based optimization because these derivatives correspond to the gradient um, of the optimization functional of the target functional with respect um, to, the, to the external field. And so that's option number one.
because of that guy here. And option number two, you don't need the gradient. You just parameterize your external control in whatever expansion is suitable, like Fourier would be, of course, an obvious choice. It could also be some other basis, um, uh, splines or whatever suits your problem best. And then, and you, because you want this parameterization to not contain too many parameters, and then you can also just brute force optimize it with uh, some, some of the um, algorithms which are, um, which are out there like uh, Malunit or something slightly more sophisticated. And these are then gradient free. So here's a mistake that I made because we just use the functional itself, the J, Um, but the same idea, you, you optimize J by determining, um, by changing your expansion, your parameterization of, of epsilon. Okay, so now I'll, I'll get back to the theory a bit more quickly, but let me give you um, one example from my group, it's a part of the PhD thesis of uh, Sabrina, who, who will defend it um, next week. And what she did um, was to look to use exactly this machinery um, for the problem of how to prepare a Rydberg state. So a Rydberg state is an, the valence electron of an atom, which we can describe <clears throat> by these three quantum numbers. We put the atom in an external field and then um, Rydberg states are those with a very highly excited value of um, n, let's say 50 or so. So that would be correspond to the zero here. That would be the energy of this 50 or 51. And then we have um, the different um, orientational quantum numbers that uh, belong to the manifold of that um, Rydberg level. And the circular states are the one here out at the edges of this uh, diamond-like structure are those with the maximal value um, of this orientational quantum number. And they are called circular because if you plot um, the wave function, this is how it looks like. So here, this is not um, some dust or so on your screen, it's the nucleus. And this plot is actually to scale. So this is the orbital of the electron in such a circular state. And then you have the quantum number with plus ML max and minus ML max. And you can think of the electron going around in one direction in this orbital or in the other one um, for plus and minus here. And these states are, are particularly interesting uh, for quantum information because they're super long lived. And we've used now optimal control to prepare the atoms in this um, state. So our goal was to go from the initial state. Um, this was our initial state, which is where laser excitation brought them. And this was the desired final state. And here's a pulse that our experimental colleagues have used before, not optimized. And it's something which is akin to a pi pulse, but for this 50 level um, ladder. And you see that the best, if they would stop their field here, this is the best that they would get. It's something like 80%. Okay, so this is what you could do um, without optimal control. And now Sabrina worked hard and her experimental colleagues worked hard and use this machinery where we said, okay, let's find a pulse that brings us to the circular state. And here's the result. So on top is shown um, the amplitudes of the two um, field quadratures that uh, we got from the optimization. And what is shown here is the population um, in these intermediate states um, in solid are our theoretical calculations and in um, dots are the experimental results. And you see that um, we get pretty close to uh, 100. So we calculated 99%. In experiment, they ended up at 97%. Didn't want to calibrate any further, but 
because they were already happy after having pushed this up from, from 80%. Okay, and then um, initially our experimental colleagues were a bit hesitant whether they should try, but then you see this pulse does not look so complicated or crazy. And we even understand uh, to some extent what's going on um, with the in the dynamics here. Um, so they were then uh, more courageous and said, well, let's um, also look at something where we do not even have a protocol. We don't know by hand how to create a non-classical superposition state. So here, um, the idea was to create a 50-50 superposition between the circular state and um, a low M state. And again, on the top, you see the field amplitudes that we got from carrying out this optimal control calculation. And on the bottom, you have the population dynamics measured and calculated. Okay, so again, to how to create such a non-classical superposition, you wouldn't even know how to do without optimal control. Okay, so um, with this, I maybe you are now um, curious to hear more um, how to actually do these calculations. So here's the slide that I showed you before. The key point is we treat our goal, so the transformation into the target state as a functional of the yet unknown field. And then we ask for an extremum. And there are various ways of doing this. Um, our preferred choice is um, a method that goes back to the mathematician Kortov, and who developed this actually in the context of um, classical dynamics, mainly for, um, I think, again, space um, applications. And we looked at the quantum version of Kortov's method. And the reason why we like Kortov's method so much is that it's very versatile. So we can look at not only the Schrodinger equation that, I, that we used in the example I just showed you, we can also have nonlinear equations of motion. We can include dissipation, which is of course important if you want to look at open quantum systems. We can have nonlinear uh, coupling to controls. So instead of having just sigma x times your control, it could also be um, some um, control squared, let's say u squared co uh, coupling to sigma z or whatever. And we can uh, look at quite um, unconventional target functional. So not just a specific state that we want to reach or a specific uh, quantum operation that we want to implement. These are uh, of course completely viable um, targets, but sometimes uh, you may want to be, um, the, what, what you really care about may not be a specific um, state or a specific um, gate. And I'll, I'll get back to that later. Okay, and so just one, one more very technical comment. So what is so nice about Kotov's method, unlike all the other um, approaches to optimal control is that it's, he provides a constructive proof how to uh, turn this extremum condition into a numerical algorithm that is guaranteed to converge monotonically. And if you go through this proof, then you'll end up with an equation that tells you how do you have to change your external control. This is this equation um, down here. And in this constructive proof, he um, introduces a couple of uh, quantities that in for classical applications, he just had to, um, to assume or to, con to conjecture that they obey certain limits. Because of the state space and quantum mechanics, because of the compactness of normalization, essentially, we can actually calculate those uh, quantities and get a complete um, numerical recipe. So that's technical comment end. And we can now um, get back and look in a bit more detail what this equation is actually um, telling us. And 
Um, so there's a, Christiana, there's a general question in mm -hmm. the Q&A. Um, Fahan Chaudhuri is asking, why not grape? Why not grape? Yeah. Um, so grape is in some instances very similar to um, to Kortov's method. Um, let me let me go a little bit further and then I come back to this question because it's an interesting question. Let me just um, put one do one more point of, of um, advertising. So we've recently uh, put out a Python implementation uh, of Kortov's method, which is also what is used in the notebooks that we have prepared for your exercises. Um, and this um, is interfaced with Qtip. So if you're already familiar with Qtip, then this is something that will be very easy for you um, to use and you can download it uh, from GitHub um, and play with it. And we've also provided a couple of worked examples um, that covers um, basic problems from the control of both closed and open quantum systems, mainly with applications and quantum information. Okay, so, and I will not forget about the grape question. Let me um, just look at the central equation once more. So this equation is what you get when you carry out the, um, the extreme room conditions. So again, and I'll again I'll ask you to do this as part of the exercise in a in a somewhat simpler version, just to see for you to see how from asking these um, two conditions to getting to um, this equation by carrying out those those variations. Okay, but again, this is the result of those two conditions inserting J and carrying out the variations. So. And here I show you um, one example for this equation. If your target is, as we discussed before, to um, evolve a given initial state and make it match a desired target state. So, and I'll come back to the structure of the, of the equation in a minute. It's very easy to extend this functional from a given initial state to match a final target state to a quantum gate. And to this end, we have to uh, match not a state that is evolved to um, a target state, but in, instead we have here the actual evolution Okay, this is this operator um, U. If your Hilbert space is larger than your logical space, let's say you look at superconducting qubits, where um, you have the two lowest levels, which are your qubit, but you have higher levels as well, then you need to project this evolution down into the logical subspace. So this is what is done here. And then this is the um, actual evolution in the logical subspace. And once you're in the logical subspace, you match it with the desired operation, which I called O. So O is the desired operation. And instead of a scalar product between a time evolved state and the target state, we have the Hilbert Schmidt product between the desired operator and the actual operator. Okay. And okay, maybe the intuition between that and, and just going from a standard scalar product to a Hilbert Schmidt product looks quite obvious. But of course, the, the devil is always in the detail. But all that we need to do now is remember the basic rules of quantum mechanics. So in order to evaluate the trace, and we need to, um, the trace is, of course, part of the Hilbert Schmidt product. Um, we, we just need to evaluate it in some basis of our choice. And if we, let's say, take the basis of the logical subspace and number it with index K, then what do we get? So we have here our basis state and we apply the operator O onto this basis state. And 
if we draw like some imaginary line here, so this is the action of the desired operation onto one of the basis states. And this is the action of the actual evolution onto the initial basis state. So, so the part to the right of this dashed line gives me the time evolved basis state K. And I'm matching it to the basis state K to which I applied the desired evolution. So I'm really taking it back to the intuition behind this matching of states. And in this way, I can optimize um, for a gate, oh, let's say a C naught or a Hadamard or whatever you want. And now, if you're using uh, Q-tip, for example, you you may um, know that one of the optimal control tools, which comes as an integral part of Q-tip, not on top of it, is Grape. It's another optimization algorithm, another way to evaluate the gradient. And you may wonder. Um, is it better to use than Kotov's method or not? And we actually have a bit of a discussion, um, more detailed than I'll give it now, in, in our documentation paper for the code, um, which is cited up here. But for a gate optimization, like shown here, there is not a big difference. The main difference is in how you actually calculate the field. So let's have a look at this. So. Let's call. Um, there's a, a quick question in the chat, mm -hmm. um, and it's asking about the update equation for the uh, control. And it looks like that there's a epsilon nu on the right hand side for the update. And does that mean that this is an implicit equation or, or not? It's, that's a very good question. So yes, it is an implicit equation. So what this delta epsilon here means really is, of course, that this is um, epsilon nu, which we do not yet know, minus epsilon old. So indeed, I have epsilon nu um, on the left-hand side of the equation and on the right-hand side of the equation. But, and here's one more technical detail about Kotov's method. So I told you he has this constructive proof that guarantees us a um, converging algorithm. This proof actually assumes that you have, um, everything is continuous, time continuous. In particular, your controls are time continuous, which means that we'll take fairly small time steps. And then we can use a simple trick to um, do a zeroth order approximation to, to this uh, dependence on epsilon nu here. And I'll show you exactly on the slide that I was just going to um, open how that, how that is done. So again, this is what we have to evaluate, right? So let's call That part here, let's call this um, she k, and we are propagating it. Um, dagger means inverse, so from capital T to little t. So this is actually this expression here is um, chi k at the final time t, which means I have my target. Okay, and then here I have backward propagation. And this is what is shown on this uh, graph also. So I'm starting with, for each of the um, states in my logical basis, with this state at final time, which I know because I know my basis and I know my desired target. And then I'm using, um, the guess pulse or the pulse from the from the previous um, iteration, the old. Okay, so the I here is, oh, is old. I propagate backward in time, and I do this until I reach um, time zero. So 
I need to store all these um, values of my states at these times or recalculate them, but I need to know them. And then that's a prerequisite. And then I can go about evaluating in the second step um, this equation. So what do I do? Now here, this is my initial state. And now I propagate with you, so forward in time, from zero to time t. And now you wonder, well, how can I do that? Because I don't know um, this epsilon nu, which I would need to propagate from zero to, let's say, um, t1. Well, the point is we use two different time grids on which we calculate the states. So these are, the, this is really time. And the, the field we evaluate midpoint between two times on which we represent the states. So here we take the initial value of that initial state, calcul evaluate um, this expression, cheat a little bit, because we say, now this is not really t, this is at the midpoint of this inter interval, so t0 plus um, a half of delta t. And then we use this value of epsilon one of nu in order to calculate the forward propagation that gives us the state here um, at the next time. Once we have the state, we can again evaluate the update equation, get the epsilon nu at the next midpoint and so on until we reach the final time um, phi. And then we can evaluate our target. If you're happy, we exit the loop. And if not, um, we use this new field becomes the old field. We propagate backwards and repeat this until we are happy with our fidelity. Okay, so, and with this slide, I have actually answered, or I am answering both questions that were just raised. So one was, um, how do I go about having this epsilon nu here, this implicit equation? And the other one was, what is the difference to grape? So what we see from this sketch, this is true for Kotov's method, because we update our control sequentially. So one time after the next, after the other. And that's the main difference to, to grape, because in grape, you first do this backward propagation, forward propagation, you use a, a different discretization between old and new fields. And that's why you can then do the update of your field at the end of both propagations simultaneously or concurrently um, for all points in your time grid at once. So in GRAPE, you have a so-called concurrent update, whereas in, in Kotov, um, you have a sequential update. Okay, and that has... Um, Consequences, both good and bad for, for both versions. So for example, um, Kotov, because it's based on this constructive improve, which aims at monotonic convergence, it converges initially much faster than grape. Um, however, in grape, it's much simpler because you, you do all times at once. It's much simpler, for example, to include spectral constraints. You can also do this in cutoff, but uh, it's it's more more tricky, more technically, more technical. Uh, I have a I have a quick little question. Mm -hmm. um, you said that uh, Krotov assumes that it's it's a continuous field. Um, is that a piecewise continuous field, or 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 how does it handle solutions that end up being bang bang control, or solutions that are inherently discontinuous? Um. So 
that depends on how you set up your control. So if you just use epsilon of t at a discrete set of points, and these this discrete set of points are equally spaced, that's equivalent to doing a Fourier expansion, or in other words, to piecewise constant controls within um, each time step. Um, but you could write epsilon itself being a function of something else, um, and then use the chain rule. Um, and, and then um, you, you, you get a, um, a slightly different um, dependence. Now, regarding the bang bang um, solutions, this is something that, that is favored by many numerical uh, optimization algorithms. Um, so yes, you tend to get short peaks, but indeed, if your time discretization um, starts to become um, of the same order as the variation, the time dependence of the field, then your algorithm breaks and you'll get numerical garbage. So you, you have to make sure that um, you have to make sure that, that your time discretization is, um, is small enough. But again, you're regularizing um, the, the control via these constraints. So um, it's actually not as bad as it might sound on, on first, um, first sight. Thanks. Okay, so at this point, it's um, one more time to refer to the exercises um, because what um, the two notebooks do that are provided as part of exercise uh, three. So I showed you. So this is when you go to the GitHub uh, link that I provided on the PDF you'll get into this um, directory and one and two are, are uh, exercises in problems um, one and two. And then three here is the optimal control um, exercise. And it actually contains um, two notebooks, which despite the server, no, you don't see it. Um, and it actually may take, so this is something that, um, this may take a couple of minutes. And also sometimes you get an, an error because if too many people click at um, this binder link at the same time, um, then, then you just have to repeat it a couple of minutes um, later. And um, also it needs to load all these Python environments. So um, that takes time. So I think let's not um, do this at the moment. You can do it later, but let me just tell you what are these two exercises that are hidden in this notebook exercise number three. So one is the state-to-state -state transfer in a two-level system. Of course, in principle, you know already the control solutions because we can work them out analytically. But it's actually nice to have something where you know what the control should be because this allows you to play with the method and to turn the parameters and see um, how you can um, influence the convergence and how the, how the method calculates the, the solution. Okay, and then um, as a slightly more complex um, example, here's again, this um, three level um, system also called Lambda system because of the shape here. Um, and with uh, these two fields, which are called the pump and the Stokes. And again, you want to look at various versions of state transfer. And what you'll see there, we have provided both a variant um, for an open quantum system, but also for, uh, for a closed quantum system, but also for open quantum system. And the solutions uh, will not necessarily be the same. Okay, and uh, here I even put, um, again, you need to scroll down to see these notebooks. And this is what I was trying to open uh, online, but so here you have Two level exercise and the uh, three level exercise. And so these two notebooks have been uh, provided by Matthias Kraus, who's also linked here with his email address. So this is Matthias. Um, and if not, how many are we today? Um, 90 people or so, right? Um, 
So if not all of you send him emails at the same time, he'll also be happy to answer questions that you have if you have problems with running the notebooks or questions um, about what you get. Okay, um, how are we doing with time? We have half an hour, 30 minutes. We have 30 minutes left, so that's not too much. I do want to go over um, the open quantum systems, but um, shall we take another break of, let's say, a couple of minutes? Sure. Four, five, something like this. Yeah, there is one question, additional small question on mm -hmm. the, the blast part, which is um, about the update for Epsilon T. And so the question is, since the update for Epsilon T contains Epsilon nu, is that then an implicit equation that needs to be solved for Epsilon nu? Um, yes, so I, I, had, I had hoped I have answered that question. Um, so the way we solve it is with this trick, which is, so you could treat this if you wanted to as a Friedhelm equation of uh, second kind and, and solve it. Um, but it, it's fully sufficient to do a zeroth order treatment, which amounts to what I described here, that you, you have a time grid, let's say, um, let me draw this. So this is the time for the states. Okay, so t equals zero, um, t equals one for the states. And then you have a time grid for the um, control. So this would be T zero for the control and this would be T one for the control and so on. So, um, so you you, you, you're cheating a little bit by, by, shift, by putting the, the field at the midpoint of a time. So this is a time step um, for the states and you put your field in the midpoint of that and then you just evaluate this from the states at T0 and then use this to propagate to T1, evaluate T1 by taking um, the states at this shifted time and so on. Yeah, I think we've been uh, satisfied. Yeah. At least the asker said so. Yeah, yeah, it's, she responded, right. Okay, so let's say three minutes until five past and then um, final stretch for open quantum systems. Very good.
Okay, so let me um, continue in order not to run too much um, over time. And I just saw that um, Stephanie Günther is actually in the room. If she's around later on uh, in the breakout session and you have questions about how to choose the representation of your control, she would be a good person to ask. So, and I think, I mean, um, yeah. Okay, so controlling open quantum systems is the final chapter and I'll move um, a little bit faster. So open quantum systems, we can describe them in, in a Hamiltonian fashion if we really wanted to, at least formally, meaning that we have a system, which is given by this HS, we have an environment and the two of them interact. And now I think, but that's a, a bit a matter of taste that we should call system what we can control. So by definition, degrees of freedom, which I control, I would put into, into the system and everything else is the environment. And because our control is limited, obviously there will be certain things which we cannot control, but which exactly is rigorously still an open question. And also what are good strategies? You have some examples and I'll give you a, a brief glimpse um, of, of the questions that have been asked and answered, but there's still no um, general picture. And in particular, um, how, so what are viable quantum control strategies and how they depend um, on the properties of the environment and on the properties of the coupling between the environment and the system um, are not yet known. And as I alluded to already, because we are only controlling a subset of degrees of freedom, there are certain things which we cannot control. Um, and, and even these fundamental limits are not fully clear yet. But I, I want to already point out now um, that while this may um, draw a rather dark picture, that's not necessarily the case because certain control tasks can only be realized if I do have um, dissipation. So cooling being, of course, a prime example or closely related to qubit reset, where I need to get rid of entropy. And the only way of getting rid of entropy is to send it to the environment. And, and these ideas of, of resetting or, or cooling are very closely related to uh, what is called quantum reservoir engineering, where um, if you know that you have a control task that benefits from, from dissipation, you engineer the coupling between the system and the environment to get the desired dissipation. Okay, but before going to some more involved um, examples, let me one more time um, stay simple and let's look at Stirab again. So we have one, uh, two, three, and these are the controls with the detuning of the pump and the detuning of the Stokes. And the first step, and I think this is part of um, exercise 2.1 or so, is to go from the Hamiltonian um, where you have the field that couples to all transitions, because again, you have to think of the external field as a superposition of the pump and the stokes. And a priori, it's the total field that couples to these um, transitions. And I think that's um, not necessarily obvious to, to everybody because um, usually people start from the Hamiltonian in the rotating frame Let's abbreviate this. 
So if you do the corresponding frame transformation and invoke um, the rotating wave approximation, then you'll end up um, with a Hamiltonian that has a significantly simpler structure, namely, you see that the pump um, amplitude only couples to um, the transition between uh, one and two. And the Stokes amplitude only couples to the transition uh, between two and three. So these Rabi frequencies are defined as before. And the detuning similarly is with respect to the energy difference between either level two and one or two and three. And we allow for a time dependent frequency. So here, if you compare these two fields, so here is the total E field with both terms. Here is just one of those components. So on in the rotating wave approximation, um, you, the field only couples to the transition to which it is resonant. And now if you set um, the two photon detuning to zero, meaning that delta P is equal to delta S, or both of them are zero, doesn't matter then you can um, diagonalize this Hamiltonian analytically and you get, again, for each instant in time, just as we've done uh, in the discussion of the adiabatic following, and you get closed form expressions um, for the three time dependent eigenstates. And so there's plus and minus, which depends on states one, two, and three. And then there is the state that I call phi um, zero, which surprisingly only uh, contains contributions from one and um, three, but not from two. So here, theta is given by the um, ratio of the two RB frequencies. And this is peculiar because if now we allow for um, decay, then any state that contains a contribution from two would be a bright state because it emits um, fluorescence or it emits photons. Whereas the zero state does not contain two and therefore also does not, is not subject to this decay with rate gamma. So this is a so-called dark state. And that is um, another reason, not only the robustness of the population transfer, but for the particular protocol of Stirup that uh, people like it so much, because even though you are passing in principle via this level two in order to get from one to three, um, you're never actually populating two if you stay in that um, dressed state, phi zero, which is the dark state. Okay, and one comment that I want to make here in view of control of open quantum systems is that this is actually um, an example for a one-dimensional decoherence-free um, subspace, or DFS. Um, and if you're interested in more details on that, there is, it's a bit dated, but there is a very nice book chapter by um, yesterday's lecturer and, and Birgitta um, that explains not only this concept uh, very didactically, but also the connection to, um, to Stira. So. And 
the what is nice about this connection is that these decoherence free subspaces, they correspond to a symmetry uh, condition, and that gives you um, a systematic way of determining those dark states. So Stirab historically was found, I would say, by chance. Um, but here you have sort of a, a way to find those um, dark states um, by, by construction. And what is nice about this in view of um, controlling open quantum systems that this is a strategy if you can stay in a dark state that you simply avoid decoherence. So that's of course a perfect way um, to control. But in general, this is um, what are these viable control um, strategies is still an open question and we can you know distinguish on the one hand between fighting decoherence um, or avoiding so if we can find a decoherence free subspace perfect but what not how can we fight it well one way is by being very fast and that was actually the motivation for the example on the Rydberg um, atom that I showed you um, earlier so to do this as fast as possible, such as not to suffer from decoherence. And another strategy is what is called dynamical decoupling. But I, I won't have um, really time to go into this um, at the moment. So one option is um, fight or avoid um, decoherence. But on the other hand, I already alluded to the fact that certain control tasks actually need the environment. So you could also think, well, maybe I can exploit it. Um, and then that could be to enhance, for example, cooling rates. The question is that possible um, or identify environment enabled control mechanisms. or uh, what I said before, quantum um, reservoir engineering. So the key question for optimal control, and I wanna come back uh, to this now is, well, how do we quantify success? I introduced before um, the optimization functional, and I had called it um, JT. And one um, option was to say, I take the real part of the propagated um, initial state and I match it with my target state, All right? So that was true for coherent dynamics. Now we are in open quantum system. So how do I quantify success? Well, I could again, use the analogy between the scalar product that um, I see here and the Hilbert Schmidt product and simply say, um, well, let's use the trace of the propagated um, T uh, of the propagated density operator at the final time and match it with the desired target, whole target. And and again, this would be, um, of course, dependent on our external controls. Now, this choice is okay only if the target state is pure. And it fails if the target state is mixed. Of course, in many cases, the target state should be um, or will be pure, but um, not necessarily so. And um, I think there's a nice picture to visualize um, the reason behind that. So let me, um, let me show that. So here's again our um, Bloch sphere. And we can, for any um, 
n-level system, we can write a state in terms of a vector of this uh, Bloch sphere by saying we have rho, we expand it into a basis of traceless Hermitian operators. Um, and then we have expansion coefficients and these traceless Hermitian operators a k. Um, and we can, I can think of this as the identity and then a scalar product between the vector of expansion coefficients r and the vector of these um, traceless Hermitian operators um, a. And then this r really corresponds to the a vector on the Bloch sphere. And the reason why um, this choice of optimization functional will not give you what you want is that if you look at this uh, expression in the scalar product, we have two things. We have um, the length um, of R and its angle, right? And if our state is mixed, then the length of this state is not one. It doesn't point all the way to the sphere. Whereas it's very easy to, to convince yourself that if you spell this out uh, in this Bloch sphere notation, then um, you will always maximize towards um, the a state of length one. So here you should be uh, careful and you could think that the better way now is to say, well, instead of having this abstract Hilbert Schmidt product, we can write our um, target in terms of the length of the Bloch vector that we want and the angle um, to the target state and minimize um, the length, uh, minimize this um, angle and match the length. So, so this is already one example for how we should think about the optimization uh, functional. And what this optimization functional does is it encodes all the physics that we want. Save for the equation of motion. Okay, so this is given, um, but it's part of our model. So what do I mean by this? Well, we have our optimization functional, functional of the controls that we want to determine. And we typically have uh, a final time contribution and constraints. And these very often depend on the intermediate times. So they can depend on the state at the intermediate time, on the control, or just on time. And these are the intermediate time constraints or costs in the language of um, optimization. So for example, we can um, constrain the change in amplitude. So that would be a constraint that depends on the control where we say this change should be um, small. Alpha is a parameter of the, actually I call it lambda, I think in the, in the script with which we should work. So let's call it lambda A. And S is the shape um, to turn on and off our fields um, smoothly. We can also think of having time dependent targets for example, if you want to optimize um, a time dependent expectation value, let's say of some operator, okay, A we already used, um, let's, let's call it O. So that would be the expectation value of um, O as a function of time. And this would be relevant if we want to, for example, minimize the energy of a system or um, its entropy, um, or we could think of maximizing um, squeezing. So then um, this could be an interesting um, optimization functional. And that would depend on intermediate times because we take, we look at it as a function of time. Okay, so now let me give you just um, as maybe inspiration to look into this in, in a bit more detail in what is already literature, some examples uh, for the control of open systems. And here I want to um, advertise one more functional that I would call um, unconventional. 
which is based on the Cartan decomposition of, of SU4. And so for a two qubit gate, we can write any two qubit gate uh, in terms of local operations K1 and K2, and then the non local part, which is given by this exponent and the product of these three, um, the, the sum of these three Pauli matrix uh, products. And this has a, a very nice geometric uh, interpretation that Birgitta um, knows about very well. And you can use, instead of optimizing for a specific gate, you can optimize for these expansion coefficients and these characterize specific classes of gates, or you can extend this idea even further and say you, you don't care whether you, calc uh, you, you can optimize for a C naught or for, for um, square root of I swap. You just want any perfect entangling gates. And then this is given by this shaded area here and we can use, I will not go into details, but we can use this as our optimization target. So instead of optimizing for a specific gate, we just want to enter this shaded area, which represents all the perfectly entangling gates. And a second um, trick, and both of these are go back to a former PhD student of mine, Michael Gertz, who's actually also the, the key developer of this Kotov Python package. So if you ever run into trouble with that, you'll probably be in touch um, with him and he's, really nice answering uh, fairly quickly. And the other trick that he developed is it's very nice to actually combine these two ways of doing optimizations um, that I mentioned earlier. So you, you can do a pre-optimization um, using a simple parametrization of your pulse and then use this pre-optimized pulse to do a gradient-based search, either grape or cutoff whatever you prefer. And that significantly speeds up the convergence and, the, and reduces the numerical cost of your, of your optimization. Okay, and then what kind of questions can you ask? Well, for example, you can, if you do this optimization towards this um, area of perfect entanglers and you reduce the time in which you allow uh, to do that, then you see by starting from different initial gas fields, um, whether you get pretty much any perfect entangling gate for a given architecture. So here two um, superconducting qubits or just a few of them, or if you make the time very short, then just a single one uh, remains. And that tells you that this is probably sort of the natural gate um, for this setup. And you can also ask what is the fastest universal set of gates? So. Um, one entangling gate and all the um, single qubit gates that you need. And then you find a trade-off um, between the, the so-called speed limits for the entanglement, entangling gates and the uh, local gates. You can um, look at qubit reset. And here I just want to give you um, a flavor of the problem because this is what I um, asked you if you want to, um, to look at as uh, part of the, the last uh, problem set. So the, we can reduce this to the following setup. We have a qubit and we couple it strongly to an auxiliary qubit. So here we have um, a strong coupling, let's call it J. And this auxiliary qubit, we can think of it really as a, um, another qubit or as a degree of freedom, a mode of the environment. And then everything is embedded or this mode is embedded in um, a larger um, reservoir to which it couples with the rate um, kappa. And then the question is, and this can be answered with um, optimal control. What is the fastest way um, to reset this qubit? And the reason why we split the environment into a strongly coupled mode and the weakly coupled rest is because this is already um, hinting at how to, to, to do the protocol. And it turns out that um, if we check different ways of control, so here we have our external uh, control that then um, sigma z control is optimal. 
if we have um, sigma x coupling with this coupling rate um, j. Um, and the reset time is given also by this um, coupling constant um, j. So, so this is something that because the setup is so simple, you can already look at yourself numerically with the, with the help of the notebooks um, or the help of this, this examples on the package that I um, told you about. And we, we've also looked at how to improve uh, quantum um, reservoir engineering. And I think here, I forgot to put the graphics, Never mind. I can also tell you Um, so we looked at using the tools of optimal control, we um, now I remember what I wanted to do. I wanted to explain to you what is quantum reservoir engineering. So let's look at again, two examples that you know. So here you have bad dissipation because it takes the state of your uh, qubit to the origin, to the completely mixed state. Whereas here you have good dissipation because you cool to the ground state. And the way to think about it is what are the steady states of your um, equation of motion? So maybe now I'm moving um, very fast, but you have, if you remember um, in the very beginning, we wrote as the equation of motion, the equation for the density operator, which has a coherent part that depends on controls and a dissipative part. And all of this I can think of as a Liouvillian acting on our density operator. And now we are looking in quantum reservoir engineering, we look at steady states. So states for which um, this derivative uh, vanishes. And we want the steady state to be interesting. So here, the steady state will be the totally mixed state, not interesting. Here, the steady state will be the ground state. That's nice. So we have to choose the controls in our Hamiltonian, such as to influence the steady state of that um, operator. That's the basic idea of quantum reservoir engineering. And again, we can use optimal control ideas to determine what are these um, what are these controls, and even what are the um, coupling elements that we want. And this is what we did um, in this example here, um, where it allowed us to uh, improve a scheme that an uh, experimental group from from Boulder had developed a little bit, a few years earlier on this driven dissipative evolution. And we showed how to modify it um, with the help of optimal control, such that in principle, we can reach the error correction threshold. So here you have 10 to the minus four, if you just have enough beam power and the experiment is not yet there, but it's on their way. So at least they tested that this indeed this modified um, scheme that we identified with optimal control um, works in the experiment. And if they can improve their heating rates, then they will hit um, this error correction threshold. So this is of course some very um, recent work. Again, just to give you a bit of an idea. And with this, let me um, close the lecture. I hope I'm not running too much over time. So let me close with three rules. And 
these are still, I would say somewhat preliminary because we're in the middle of a very evolving um, field, but for sure we can distinguish between cases where the decoherence and the dissipation is detrimental. And in our experience, and again, I walked over this quite quickly, but let me just give you the bottom line of a couple of years of um, researches, that this is undesired uh, Markovian evolution. And then the strategy is beat the dissipation or beat the decoherence, either by operating fast or by avoiding it, for example, with help of a symmetry, like in the case of the um, decoherence-free subspaces. There can also be um, beneficial cases. So that would be desired Markovian evolution. And then the target state must be the steady state of the Leovillian. Fixed state or steady states, both um, terms are used. And in the example that I just rushed through in the last couple of minutes, this is exactly what we, what we realized in the original experiment from 10 years ago, the steady state was not completely identical to the target state. And then we modified the fields in order to make sure that this condition is really fulfilled. And that's why um, we, we could improve the, the error. And then there is the case of the dynamics being non-Markovian, so not described by the type of master equation that I wrote. Um, on the previous slide. And so there we know of some cases which are beneficial. We also know of some cases which are detrimental. But um, a complete picture is, is really, we are not there yet. Um, one case where um, we know that we can expect beneficial effects if, if we have strongly coupled modes like in the example that I just showed for the qubit um, reset, where, which are themselves sufficiently isolated such that we can almost think of them as auxiliary um, qubits or auxiliary quantum systems. But in general, um, for example, for, for one over F noise, which for superconducting qubits is so um, important, it's not clear whether we can um, find control strategies or whether we can turn this into something uh, beneficial. So here's many open questions. And I think uh, for the young students amongst you, that's uh, good news because a lot of things need to be done. Um, and I think with this, I stop. And But I'll be happy to, to take more questions either now um, or tomorrow morning for you. So the idea to, to do this tomorrow is uh, because after your breakout session, it will be very, very late um, in Germany. So I'll be not really, um, I will probably not be very good at answering your questions and hopefully tomorrow morning, uh, you'll be awake enough to ask questions. Anyway, so please, uh, more questions now or tomorrow. I wanted to pass one up from a few minutes ago. Um, what functional can be used if the target state is mixed? Okay, so this is again, something that I did not go into detail, but there are two, and two possible answers. So one is um, this, what we've used here is a Hilbert Schmidt product. And for density operators, the Hilbert Schmidt product is not identical to the Hilbert Schmidt norm. So if you replace it by the Hilbert Schmidt norm, then you're okay. Or you can also really use this uh, graphical um, picture that I have written here. 
and write the functional in terms of the uh, length of your block vector and this angle. So it, it's a bit of a lengthy expression, but I think the intuition behind it is, is very nice. Um, and, and we've compared the two, the Hilbert-Schmidt um, norm and, and this uh, geometrically motivated functional and they're, they're, in our example, the performance was, was very similar. Didn't bring any um, speed up, but, but we, we still like the, the intuition. And if you want to read up on this, so um, that is published in a paper by my former student, Daniel Basilevich. And um, okay, 2018, and it's one of those new quantum journals. I must admit it's, um, I know that's published by Wiley, but um, a advanced quantum information or advanced um, quantum technology, something like this. But um, anyway, if you look for Basilevich and publication date 2018, um, you'll find it. And then you, there, there you find the specific expressions for the functional. And also of course, a use case for a mixed target, which was uh, taken from squeezing. Okay, thank you. Christiana, um, at the very end on your last slide, when you were talking about the, the merits and the disadvantages of the three strategies, mm -hmm. you said, so in the non-Markovian case, if you have strongly coupled modes, so the idea, if they can be beneficial, you would be driving those modes explicitly. And no, you don't even need to do that. That's the surprising part, because again, I'm, I'm, I'm faithful to my own um, requirement of saying that only um, the, the system can be controlled and mm -hmm. these auxiliary modes cannot be controlled. But if they are strongly coupled, so if this J is much larger than kappa, that's yeah. exactly strongly coupled to the system and sufficiently isolated from the rest of the reservoir, um, then just by driving um, the, the system and having this uh, coupling, that's enough to, um, to exploit this, this auxiliary um, qubit or qubit. And can you get a very high degree of control of the quantum gates? Um, you can. So we actually looked at this a couple of years back um, for a flux qubit, back then when flux qubits were still um, in, in fashion. Um, mm. And simply for the reason that there was uh, an experimental system where they had actually um, characterized their, um, their two-level fluctuators. So, so the, the, the price to pay is you need to know what are your two-level fluctuators, but if you know them, I mean, if you know their spectrum um, and you know their coupling, then you can exploit them, even though they're not addressed by a control themselves. And we, we showed this again to, to make the case very clear um, we implemented um, a gate that you could not implement without having this coupling to the two-level fluctuators. Do you have a reference for that too? Yeah, so that's uh, um, the first author oh, on this was, I, I can send it to you if you want. Okay. Uh, sure. sure, sure, yeah, we can do it offline. I think we're running a little bit late now, right? So Richard, so I think, I think there aren't any more outs. Oh, there's one more question in the Q&A. One more question in the Q&A. Yeah, um, I don't see it. Uh, I can't open the Q&A. Yeah, so if, if the functional is non-convex, can Krotov still find a global minimum? From yes. Stephen? Well, global. I mean, the global. Like yes. um, so global is, I would say, um, pretty much. So you're not guaranteed to find the global um, optimum, but you're not guaranteed to find the global optimum with any of those gradient-based methods because it's a local search, okay? But if you combine it with scanning your parameter space with this pre-optimization method, um, then you can get a pretty good overview over the global um, landscape and, and that, um, but, but what Krotov can do is that even if you have a non-convex uh, target functional, it still converges monotonically. And I think that's what it really distinguishes it from, from other methods. And, and one of the examples where we do have a non-convex functional is this 
um, one for perfect entangles that is shown here for that we get from the Cartan decomposition of SU4. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. Over to you then, right? So Cody asks, is there a good review article on, on control of open quantum systems? And I think Christian wrote one. Yeah, yeah. that's right. And there's the a few others people. you can find. Yeah. Right. It's on the very first slide, right, Christiana, your 2016 paper? Yeah, yeah, that's a review. Mm -hmm. That should be very easy to find. All right, well, join me in uh, thanking Christian for such a wonderful set of lectures. So everyone hit their clapping hands on, on the Zoom. <laughs> These are very funny. Um, a, very, a couple of very quick administrative announcements. So I encourage you to join the next Zoom room. Lucien is going to post the link. Uh, to get together. We're going to put you in groups of six or so to uh, work on problems together. Those will be open until about one o'clock Pacific time. So for another hour and 15 minutes, uh, Christian provided uh, some fantastic material for you to work on. So I encourage you to do that. Um, the Q&A session, as you heard, um, is going to be tomorrow morning at 8.30 from 8.30 to nine o'clock. Um, I'm going to remind everybody and just post the link to the underlined page where all of these links can be found for the various Zoom rooms for the breakout sessions just now and for tomorrow morning. Um, and then we will have another, the next uh, set of lectures will be by um, Ivan Deutsch tomorrow morning um, on continuous measurement and quantum trajectories. And this will be a webinar. Um, and the links again are on the, on the, on the site, on the, uh, on the event webpage. So thank you again, Christian, and I hope to see you all in the in the breakout rooms. All right. Have a good night, Christian. Thanks, Christiana. Thanks. Thanks thank for hosting so much, me Brigitte. and um, enjoy You're the welcome. breakout sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You're Bye. welcome. Okay. Take yeah. care, everybody. <laughs>